recording, so whenever you're ready, go ahead. Welcome back, Requirements Engineering. I wanted to give you a brief overview of the process of software engineering and where the process of requirements engineering sits in there. So when you take the overall software engineering process, we have a few phases. It starts somewhere here. Wait, yeah, first mistake. I was gonna write software engineering up into this one, but that's actually the headline. So erase that, start again. So software engineering is the entire thing. Then this first part here is what we call requirements engineering. After requirements engineering, we go into design. From there, we move on into implementation. From there on into testing. And then we have deployment and installation. And finally, maintenance and evolution. This is like a model of the very basic software engineering process. One of the really cool old school professors in requirements engineering, his name is Al Davis, used to say, essentially, all models are wrong, but some of them are useful. And what he means by that is that any model that we make, conceptualize, draw of something is an abstraction of the actual thing. Because if we try to represent it in all detail, then it would be so complex that it's not very helpful. So we abstract from the reality, we simplify, and that way we have an easier time to get things in our head. Now, one of the abstractions of this model is we're usually not starting from scratch completely. That may be the case sometimes, but for many of the systems that you'll be working on later, there will be previous systems that you either need to replace seamlessly or where there has been an old system in place and now there is a significant shift in technology and you have to introduce something new. On the other end, we're also not going to end in nirvana, hopefully. There will be a continuous process and at some point there may be a loop back here. We have to start again with requirements engineering. We've maintained the system over time, but eventually the system has been fixed and patched in so many different places that there just needs to be a significant overhaul and then we start again over here. That is one of the simplifications. The other one is this implies a linear process. Eh, ain't happening. For those of you who already have a little experience, even just in a small, developing a small app, you know that you start somewhere here, you get to a design, you start implementing, and then you're like, oh, this didn't quite work as I thought it would. Okay, so you have to go back and fix the design and then you implement again. Or you figure out during testing wait, this is not really doing what we said we were going to do in the requirements. Go back, fix it. Go back, talk to the stakeholder, find out what they actually needed. Fix the design, fix the implementation, back to testing. Hopefully move on into deployment. So that's the next simplification. There are actually feedback loops here that go back. But this you may already have heard of in earlier software engineering courses. In our course, we, soft, we focus on requirements engineering. Now, if we take away these feedback loops, now you know that they are supposed to be there. So we'll just abstract from them. We're instead gonna look in detail into what requirements engineering is, what the phases of that one are. Again, a little simplified. Requirements engineering has four major phases. 
The first one is requirements elicitation. This means I ask stakeholders for their wishes, their constraints, I find out about their needs, and then once I have all this knowledge supposedly in my head, and I'm saying supposedly because it's not as easy as go interview three people, come back, write everything down and you're done. You probably have to go back a couple of times and clarify. You have to find out, oh, I also need to talk to the person over there. And I need to call that person in the other time zone. And sometimes you only find out here, oh, there was somebody else who I should have talked to here. We'll get to that problem later. So after requirements elicitation, what we do is requirements analysis. And requirements analysis is basically, I look at the set of requirements that I have written down and I try to find out whether they fit together. Are they consistent with each other? Or are there any contradictions where one requirement says, we are gonna need to stay below $10,000 for the development of this product. And the other requirement says, we need to have availability 24 seven, which means we need at least one redundant server, which means we're gonna run way over $10,000 budget. So we have a so-called conflict in our requirements, which means we need to go back over here, talk to stakeholders and resolve the conflict. Next phase is requirements documentation. That means I write it up in a way that I can go back to the stakeholders and say, this is how we understood what you were telling us. Are you gonna sign off on this that we are supposed to develop the requirements on this basis? And doing that is called requirements verification and validation. Wait now, which one is which? Verification, validation, so Verifying requirements is, did I correctly write down what these people said? Validating the requirements means I go back to these people and ask them, is this what you really need? So what we use as a mnemonic for verification and validation is, verification is, am I building the system right? And validation asks, am I building the right system? So those are your four phases. Start with elicitation, move on into analysis, go back if there were questions open, documentation, go back if you figure out, uh oh, that is not feasible, there are conflicts in here, or if you find you don't have enough information to properly document this. And then once you have everything written down and you think this should all be good, go back to the stakeholders and ask them if that is indeed the case. You see these arrows here are a recurring thing. And there is one more little aspect that I want to add on about arrows and recurring things. You see that all of this fits into requirements engineering. And we said from design, we often have a path where we have to go back to requirements engineering and fix something. Now, if we take all these details down here away, which this board is a little reluctant to letting me do, then we can ask ourselves what is going to happen if I make a design decision on a high level and I don't even know what the requirements are going to be on, on a lower level. Let me give you an example for that. If I develop a new car. Let's just be ambitious. We're going to develop something way cooler and better than Tesla. Right? Because we have brilliant ideas and we're going to make them all come true. And while my arm is getting sore from <laughs> erasing all of this, in our heads, you are coming up with the next vision of 
the vehicle of the future that can transport us super quick from one location to the next location, that can cook coffee at the same time and will respond to all your emails and you don't even have to navigate. So for this cool car, when you come up with your vision, then you don't necessarily know what you want the seat to look like or you don't necessarily know yet what kind of multimedia system you want in there or how the hood should be shaped. You may know some of these things, but not all of these things. First, you think of, I gotta try and develop a car, which means I need an engine, I need tires, seats, I need a body and plenty of other things. So you already take a couple of early design decisions and then you start thinking about what are the individual subsystems. So you have one system and you develop the requirements for that system. And then you go to a first design of that system. So your system design, sorry if this turns out to be tiny writing, but it says system design, no black magic to it. It's going to have three subsystems because we are making a model and we're grossly, grossly oversimplifying. This is our model. This is going to be the car. Now to understand what these subsystems need as requirements, we're going to look at each of them and perform requirements engineering again. So we're going to do requirements engineering for a subsystem. And we can repeat this process quite a few times because for, for a system as complex as a complete vehicle, we're going to have quite a few levels of breaking down systems into subsystems. So this one, spectacular, has four subsystem components. And you guessed it, we're going to do the same thing all over again. So now we're at the sub-subsystem level. Okay, to not turn this into a bad joke, I'm not going to repeat doing this. I'm also running out of board. But you get the point. We start with system level requirements, system level design, move into the next layer system design, move into the next layer, system design. And now I'm going to need a different color. The researcher Bashar Nushebi, who is a professor at the Open University in Ireland, and a pretty funny guy, by the way. If you ever meet him at a conference, he does not only develop really good research, he's also a good guy to hang out with. He developed this model called Twin Peaks, which says exactly that. You start with requirements, then you'll have to do some design decisions, dig deeper into requirements, make lower level design decisions, dig some deeper into the requirements, and so on and so forth until you have your complete system specified. So that is the Twin Peaks model. And remember, it all started with those six very simple phases of software engineering. So depending on the simplification that you make for your model and the perspective you need to analyze, you will choose a different representation of the software engineering process. But this is how the perspectives tie in with each other. Okay. <laughs>